Climate Accountable was launched really just about four years ago as as kind of the vehicle for the California disclosure um, policy. And um, what we were seeing out there, and as I did work actually at the Stanford Law School, I have a, a policy institute looking at carbon data. Um, I'm an attorney by training. And what we were starting to see in the in the space is that we weren't really getting the kind of a catalyzation of the climate economy. We weren't moving uh, and creating the markets that are required. And so what, in looking at kind of where the breakdown is, like what, why aren't we getting there? Because we know we, we, we need to do that. There is no time um, to not move towards radical decarbonization and making the green economy a win. The fact that we just didn't have this baseline data was a big gap. And so, you know, while voluntary emissions reporting had its time, you know, it was really important early on when we are trying to figure out, like, how do you do a GHG emissions profile? Companies were learning like what it takes to build the capacity internally. Uh, the reality w was that um, we're just not getting there with with this kind of incomplete data. We were getting sort of a Swiss cheese. You know, some companies would be doing some parts of uh, a scopes one, two, and three emissions GHG profile. Um, some would be doing others. And so there was really no way for us to build um, the confidence in the market to drive, uh, you know, climate tech and decarbonization. So Carbon Accountable's goal was to you know, look at what we've done in California and take a page out of our, you know, legacy of leadership and saying, well, California can put down a marker um, that can then have not only effects in the state, but in the country and globally. And so that led to the creation of the bill that is now SB 253 enshrined into law, which is uh, the first uh, state based, but also um, a U.S. requirement for GHG disclosure uh, for any company doing business in California. I would love to dig in a little bit deeper on the state bill. So I know that Carbon Accountable served really as the architect and the advisor, again, on the legal and the technical implications of the bill. Maybe just for those like myself who are quite far away from putting that kind of um, project into place, what does that even look like from that architecture and implementation standpoint? I mean, I, I, I'd like to say, um, I mean, you know, most things and, and most policies that are created are, are really built on whatever has happened before it that can be kind of repurposed for um, the particular challenge that you're trying to address as a policy matter. So, you know, in California, we also did benefit, as, as I mentioned, from the fact that we did have voluntary disclosure regimes uh, internationally, right? And so... We, we do have a robust um, kind of body of knowledge. And I will also say uh, the fact that we have a globally recognized uh, standard for GHG accounting and reporting, it's called the GHG protocol. Um, it, it, we weren't starting from scratch, right? That, that standard is what you are seeing in all of the reporting regimes uh, internationally. And, you know, we can talk a little bit more about what else has been going on? Because California is is joining uh, other jurisdictions that are putting these mandatory reporting requirements in place. So you had, you know, you look for a standard. That's always like the foundation of the policy. Like, what are you asking people to do? We have the GHG protocol. We don't need California to have its own, you know, flavor of reporting ice cream. So we've got the standard. And then the question is, well, what are we ask? Who's who reports? And um and that's where we said, if you do business in California, and we also decided that it should not just be public companies, but also private. We, we see that if you're a publicly traded company and you're doing this, we want to le le you know, level the playing field. And we also know that um, you know, in, in the United States, for instance, uh, for billion dollar revenue corporations, which is the cut for this bill, um, for every one publicly traded company, there are two private held companies. So if we don't start getting them lined up um, to be taking, you know, being smart about what they're doing, we're not going to be addressing uh, the, the climate challenge that we're facing. So those were sort of the elements of kind of the foundation for the policy. And then, um, you know, we went to Sacramento. I mean, that's kind of like how a bill becomes a law. And that's the wonderful thing about a democracy, right, is that you can roll up your sleeves. And, you know, I've had experience in other um, areas, you know, developing, uh, you know, legal uh, frameworks and proposals. So 
went to Sacramento. Um, and Senator Scott Weiner is one of those kind of lions of the Senate in California. We have so many great legislators, but he was one of those, you know, you're looking for somebody who it's a, it's a relatively, relatively new topic for policymakers, right? Like HG emissions, corporations, how do, you know, what, that this is new stuff. So um, finding somebody who was really going to get it and be able to articulate the imperative for it. And frankly, also just to say, this was not an easy bill to get passed. It, it, there was vociferous uh, business lobby opposition. I mean, we had great leading companies that came out and made all the difference. You know, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce. Um, but the main business lobby was, you know, very opposed and spent a lot of, you know, tens of millions of dollars to lobby against the, uh, you know, this bill. And we also, there was two bills in California. SB 253 was GHG emissions disclosure, which is what I was really most connected to. But we also had a companion bill, SB 261, which is a climate risk disclosure bill. So, you know, the getting a, a legislator that can really withstand that kind of business opposition is important. And that's where California has that great legacy of legislators saying, you know, uh, we've got to move things forward. So um, that's a little bit of, of how it went. And, you know, there was so many twists and turns. And we, we I think the space, the ESG and sustainability space is really moving quickly. And so we really benefited from a lot of what we're seeing uh, in terms of just companies getting on board, other jurisdictions passing laws. So, you know, we benefited from those tailwinds. And the, to repeat the term that you used, that legacy of leadership in California is certainly visible. And I think for most of us in the space who are interacting with California, we recognize how important of a body it is in the sense that it is actually the world's fifth largest economy, which always blows my mind. But that, I'm sure, is certainly what struck such a chord, positive and negative, from those different businesses because it is such a strong economy. It has such an impact on businesses around the world. Could you maybe speak to that a little bit more? Because sometimes when you think of a state bill, you think it's just within the state, but it has such a global reach. When you think about making a, a difference on the environment, I mean, it is, you know, we're just, these disclosure bills are just one in a series of like incredible uh, sort of, you know, uh, sort of nation and globally leading environmental and climate policies uh, that have been put in place in California. So it is a proud legacy. I mean, we've had, you know, early on to the toxics movement, you move to uh, focus more on climate and the environment. Uh, we that led to the cap and trade program in California, the low carbon fuel standard. These are all incredibly important components of kind of our global uh, infrastructure for addressing climate. And they have gone on to be sort of the, you know, other jurisdictions, other countries have, you know, taken, uh, you know, pages out of the playbook. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it is, um, you know, that is uh, something that makes a huge difference in thinking. I mean, California thinks about itself and like, well, if something's hard, I mean, maybe California should do it, right? Because mm -hmm. We have that legacy. We have a legislature that um, gets elected b based on leadership like this. So I think that and, and really just to recognize, too, you know, we, California is experiencing uh, the ravages of climate change, right? Like the forest fires, the flooding. And so I think, you know, if you're really going to be a public um, official, if you're going to lead for the benefit of Californians, you can't, GHG emissions don't like stop at the border of California. You can't just clean up your own backyard and um, protect the citizens and the environment in California. You you have to, you know, address the fact that we have to decrease global emissions um, if we want to protect ourselves at any point on the globe. So we're in this together. And I think that's, that's the uh, approach that we took uh, in California. And, um, you know, we was for a lot, lots of things kind of just lined up. I'd have to say I've been part of, of a lot of important or like what I thought were worthy causes. They don't always come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this happened was really a testament to, you know, um, I think, you know, a smart policy, a great author, 
I also think the fact that the EU and, you know, really put a marker down with the CSRD. I mean, there were already then companies that were going to have to be reporting like these things happen during the course of this campaign. And then I also want to just recognize that companies, I think there was really an inflection point where large corporations and leaders um, leading climate forward companies realized that it's not enough for them just to, to be good actors for their own company, that they have to be stewards of the sector. And I think that was really important because you started to see um, a pushback against business lobbies that were opposing this bill, but others and saying, you know what, it's not OK. You don't speak for us. Right. Like we ha and, and we have to sort of step out. So I, I really think that was a, a tremendous benefit. And I, I'm seeing that in other policies now. So that's really great. And with that company lens, I know a lot of our listeners tend to be really concerned about greenwashing. And I know that that is such a driving force behind the need for transparency and the need for reporting. So can you share how you've seen this translate with the implementation of this bill and how we're trying to tackle greenwashing, especially as it pertains to greenhouse gas emissions in that case? It's so important to understand, too, one of the our our real kind of goals with this bill was not only to give companies the data they need for, you know, to the insights they need to understand where they can take a scarce dollar and move it to decarbonize most with the greatest impact, but also and inform those financial markets. But as, as you're saying, really, because we are at risk of losing the confidence of the public. And that is uh, something that is going to have devastating impacts on our kind of political will, because we, we have a lot more that needs to happen. And we have to have the public confident uh, that we are actually doing what we're saying. So that that the greenwashing is just something that we absolutely had to clean up. Right. And and and, and we've seen that also with the carbon markets and carbon credits. You know, we're really at, at all levels when the data isn't um verifiable, when there isn't accountability, when we don't have assurance levels on the data, then we are really creating this sort of very soft ground um, for building a strong economy. So, yeah, so important. And, and for California, the consumer piece, you know, that was really important to us. Oftentimes, this conversation is about uh, investors, uh, and we think that's tremendously important, but we also really recognize that consumers uh, you know, need this data as well. And you did mention it earlier, this idea of, I mean, ESG is certainly polarized and absolutely politicized at the moment. And you were talking about, is there this possibility to frame solutions in a way that reaches across the aisle? Do you feel like that is actually possible? Or do you feel like we've gotten so far apart that we're almost just not even hearing each other at this point? I, I've sort of of two minds on this. I don't think we should get too distracted with like being worried that we're, you know, like we are have to redo the whole, like, you know, never say the word ESG again, or, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, at the same time, you know, I, I've done a lot of work uh, in politics and policy over time. And, you know, we, we do need to be smart about how we make our arguments. And I think it's like, regardless of what you call it, um, the, the reality is that there are challenges and opportunities that the corporate sector is um, is going to face, right? There are actual, uh, we are seeing the effects of climate change now, right? So climate risk is something that is absolutely part of the bottom line. So I think, you know, we're, we have an opportunity um, to say, you know, in the short term for your company to, you know, be resilient, you need to have the data so that you can start to make smart decisions um, to ensure the, you know, the kind of the uh, the long term strength of your company. And I think that um, when it comes to kind of the, the opportunities for uh, driving kind of the markets, I do think that uh, regardless to me, you know, if the capital markets, you know, finance doesn't talk about sustainability or doesn't say that's their fund is this thing. I think what we're seeing is that 
you know, you're, we're, we're continuing to see a, a desire, especially from consumers for these products. So, you know, it, to me, it's like, it doesn't really matter what you call them, but let's, let's just say we are, you know, that we know that there is an, a need to support companies to be successful in the future, to respond to consumers who want, you know, a clean and sustainable future. Um, and the market will be, re, you know, needs to respond to that.